George Shearing is one of the jazz greats. Louis Armstrong. Jack Peacock. He was part of the post-war jazz explosion that centered around New York's 52nd Street. Only the best ended up sharing a platform with legendary figures like Louis Armstrong. But let's uh, let Brother George Sherry show us what the real early blues sounded like when one of the New Orleans piano players was feeling good, sad, and sorry for himself. Nothing in George's background gave any hint of what was to come. He was born in 1919 in Battersea, South London, the ninth child of a coal man. Blind from birth and with no musical talent in his family, George's interest in sound had an idiosyncratic start. I remember my mum was saying to me, go round and get a penny bottle. George wants to hear a sound of a bottle breaking. So I went round the coal yard and got him a penny bottle, brought it back. And mum said, now stand down out so as well as no people will walk past while he throws it out his window. Ah. I would toss bottles out of the window on the second floor of our house just to hear them clank on the, on the sidewalk. For uh, jazz, of course, I would use beer bottles and for classical I'd use milk bottles, you know, so <laughs> even in those days I had quite a disowning taste, you know. Then I had to sweep it up. <laughs> it's funny, really. When Mum did buy my piano, she paid five pounds for it. It was an old piano, so she didn't mind what he'd done with it, really. So he used to sort of get off the hammer and bang it on there then. My father bragged it would cost uh, 15 shillings to teach me to play piano. Well, I mean, nobody can be taught the piano for 15 shillings, but it probably amounted to uh, seven lessons at two bob a crack or something, you know. George's natural talent was developed by the teachers at Linden Lodge, a school for the blind, in particular by a teacher called George Newell. At 16, he said to my parents, just the time I was going to graduate from school, Further study of classical music for this young man, man would be an utter waste of time. He said, it's obvious to me that he's going to be a jazz musician. And I went back to the school in 1962.
the same teacher was still there. And I said, Mr. Newell, do you remember the advice you gave my parents when I was 16? He said, yes, I do. I said, has it come to your attention that I've played many symphony concerts through the United States, playing concertos with many of the well-known symphony orchestras? He said, yes, it has. I said, armed with that information, if you had to give that advice today, what would you say? And he said, I suspect your largest dollar still comes from jazz. I said, it does. And he said, my advice would be exactly the same. <laughs> Very wise man. So you left the, the school then with this advice and started to try to make a living as a, well, frankly, beginning as a pub pianist, wasn't it? That's right. I would play things like... Melancholy, melancholy baby. baby. That was the big one at the time. I was a, I was a Charlie Coons fan, so. <laughs> the publican would say to me, George. He said, "You know, this is a neighbourhood bar." And he said, I wish you would dress a little bit more casually. He said, you know, coming over here with that kind of dress, it's it just so out of place. So I said, well, I have other jobs to go on to when I leave. And he said, well, I think you should choose between them and me. And I said, I will. When would you like me to leave? My father said, son, you should be ashamed of yourself. He said, the man has been so good to you. I don't think I have to describe to you the pride and the, the faithfulness of the British working man. I said, Dad, being good to me, he's paid me my salary. I was playing it under better conditions. I was playing in the Park Lane Hotel, Grosvenor House Hotel, and at the Greyhound Racing Association in Wimbledon. And we would play in the first half of the program Selections from Glamorous Night, you know. And in the second half of the program, we play some uh, jazz or something close to it. And I'd get to my, wear my tuxedo. And I'd make as much money in two or three nights a week as I would make in six nights playing at the pub. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a move on. By the outbreak of war, George was well known as a jazz pianist. And as other musicians were called up, his schedule became more hectic and his fame grew. One of his partnerships was with Stefan Grappelli. I was very much impressed because in those days it was really quite rare to hear an English musician that had that kind of talent for playing what was essentially an American art form. You know, he'd be really swung and uh, had nice rhythmic feeling. And uh, in general, he sounded more like an American musician than just another English guy trying to play him in American style. And uh, he also played the accordion, which is an instrument I detested, uh, but I thought it was a novelty. And, and on one early recording, which I've happily been able to live down. I played the piano and George played the accordion. We call it squeezing the blues. And it is fortunately totally forgotten now. I hope the master was destroyed. <laughs> Thank you. 
course, I don't play the accordion anymore, you know. I found out that a true gentleman is a man who knows how to play the accordion and doesn't. It's a shame. It's got a lovely sound, an accordion. You I like the accordion? I, I had a guy playing it the other night. I just thought, what a beautiful sound it was. A guy called well, it's uh, accordion how it's played, isn't mm. it? Oh, sorry. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you feel that you had to come to the United States? You're doing very well indeed in England, to put it in a I was, formal sense. but you know... You wanted to come here. I wanted to come here because I thought I'd gone as far as I could go. I was a leader of my own band for maybe one night a week, but for the most part I was a high-priced sideman. When I first came into New York, I literally stamped my feet on the sidewalk. And I said to myself, this is the birthplace of Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, Count Basie, Art Tatum, Billy Hunter, Ella Fitzgerald. And here I am. It was a scuffle until 1949. I went into agents' offices and I would play bits of Teddy Wilson and Fats Waller and Boogie Woogie and Aunt Tatum and goodness knows. And they'd say things like, very nice, what else can he do? And my wife then would say, what do you want him to do? Stand on his head and play? Come on, George, let's, let's go. You know, we've no business being here. And what they meant is, we've got the people up here. We've got Tatum. We've got Wilson. We've got Fats Waller. Why do we need the English one? And they needed somebody with their own identity. And this didn't happen until the quintet was formed in 1949. We were at the, the end of the Bop era, you know, frantic. And we come in with this quiet sound, vibes, guitar, piano, bass and drum. I think that George could have used the same instrumentation in a different way and it would not have been nearly as successful or as famous. And I think that by having those three melody instruments play the, the melody in unison, that's what gave it a mellow, accessible sound where the melody was emphasized. And as you know, in jazz, often the melody is de-emphasized. The idea for a lot of jazz musicians is to depart from the melody as soon as possible and make no further reference to it. Well, that sometimes separates the aficionado from the, the, the average listener. I mean, it's, it shouldn't be, George doesn't approach jazz as, as some kind of code. You know, to him it's music, and the purpose of music is to communicate something about how he's feeling, and, and he wants us to feel something from that communication. Let's start with a plain major scale that everybody knows, the scale of C, doubled in the bass with the chords around it. Sometimes known as the locked hand style, and I've actually had people come up to me in all seriousness and say, are your hands locked together when you play that? I said, if they really were, I couldn't play anything, but it's just that it all happens within the distance of an octave.
1949, September in the Rain sold a million copies. The quintet was voted Best Combo by Downbeat magazine, and George was voted one of the top six pianists in America and tipped as a future king of jazz. In 1952 came George's most famous hit, now a jazz standard. I was sitting in my dining room in New Jersey, and this thing came to me. I always say that I wrote it in 10 minutes and 35 years in the music business. And that's the important factor, not the 10 minutes it takes you to write. And you've got to present it different ways. This is something on the order of Bach to start with. best recordings of lullaby. <laughs> Had it have been written by Frederick Chopin, perhaps it would be on this order. the arrangement, the current arrangement you have with your bass player. with him is that so many little things creep in that are totally unexpected that we've never played together or that he has never played before and all of a sudden it's wow what was what is that <laughs> where are we going here if i don't catch it i'll uh, certainly listen in, in amazement and then uh, try for it the next time Success with the public didn't automatically gain him the respect of his peers, as George discovered when he was introduced to Charlie Parker. And I really should have said, I mean, I was brought up properly. I should have said, 
what would you like to play, Mr. Parker? I didn't say that. I said, what do you want to blow, Bird? <laughs> and he thought, well, let me put this guy down a little bit. Oh, how about all the things you are in five sharps? <laughs> Fortunately, I was equipped to do it. I really appreciated it as being a test. Can you put your fingers where your mouth is, Sonny? You know, <laughs> I really did. <laughs> I loved that man. He was just a joy. I think that George disproved several notions. One is that um, Europeans don't understand the concept of swing. Well, that was pretty quickly dispelled, just listening to him play. And the other is a racial thing. I mean, he is a white person, but um, he is, but I don't think that he, well, there's an old story that, that Dizzy Gillespie came up to George Shearing one time, and he said, George, I have something I have to tell you. And George says, what's that, Dizzy? He said, you're black. And, uh, and I think that, in a way, that's Dizzy, um, you know, trying to make a point. And um, it's true, George fits into that community in a way that um, was seamless. I am very fortunate. I feel that I probably went through one of the toughest apprenticeships anybody can serve because we would be playing opposite Louis Armstrong with Earl Hines and Jack T. Garden and a bunch of stars in that band. And then my quintet. And then we'd be playing opposite the Machito big band, which of course got me very interested in the Latin thing. The conga drum is on forehand. It's like one, two, three. And the bass, and the piano, I cannot play all those rhythms together, but there are two or three very complicated rhythms which go on, uh, all at the same time. stars well, baby, you can have me for yourself or all by yourself you are meant for me daddy I don't want nobody else despite the variety of styles in 1978 after 29 years of the quintet George was bored the quintet broke up primarily because I found I could put it on automatic pilot. When you start to get bored with something, you've got to do something about it because it shows first to yourself, secondly, you know, to, to the critics and to the public. So you've got to uh, do something about it. And I did. I went down to, to bass and, and uh, piano. It gave me a lot more freedom. I no longer had to do this. I could... Also, as a matter of fact, you can also discover what a catastrophe it is 
when Cole Porter gets in the way of Ludwig van Beethoven. <laughs> The breakup of the quintet gave George Shearing much more freedom. He still lives in New York with his second wife, Ellie, a classical singer. Before I met George, I had heard him only in the role of a soloist. But having been a solo singer myself, I also found that he is a wonderful accompanist. And accompanying is an art in itself, and that was something I never knew about George. Because an accompanist has to be able to know when the singer is going to breathe, when they're going to slow down, when they're going to speed up. And that George has. George has that wonderful innate quality of, uh, of knowing just what to do when. He's so easy to sing with. He doesn't drag you, he doesn't push you. And I always kid and say that I thought he was such a wonderful accompanist for me. I couldn't afford him, couldn't afford to hire him, so I married him. <laughs> well, we used to call each other two bodies with but a single musical mind. And the reason for that was that we both have a kind of strange radar going. He'll start playing something and even incorporate a piece of classical music into the popular vein. And I will respond in kind and add to the pastiche, okay? And consequently, uh, we find that those hair trigger moments, those wonderful, wonderful moments when we, we gel, when we coalesce, uh, are absolutely marvelous. That it might as well be spring. It might as well.
delicate touch one could uh, dream of on the piano it's not bright and harsh it's it's dreamy really and I guess I don't have a, a, a hard-edged voice either so it, it, it gets that we, we belong together when we work <laughs> I was wondering, now, how with the blazes am I going to get into this? It's not going to be... Right, serious. This is Duncan's song. Serious. That we're doing, huh? Yes. Not you again. No. Oh, no. Not you again. <laughs> <laughs> Why, it's good old black and blue again. The amazing thing about his playing is that uh, it has retained something, I think, quite British without sounding in the least pompous or stuffy or uh, unrhythmical and unjazzy. Tune in a minute. <laughs> piano is not an easy instrument to become uh, distinguishable on because you don't have any things to slur or bend or make funny noises through. You have to just bang white things down and occasionally black things. And uh, George has managed to carve a niche to make him one of those few distinguishable pianists in jazz. You know, you get a, an Earl Hines style, an Oscar Peterson style, a Teddy Wilson style, an Art Tatum style and a few others, and a George Shearing style. You cannot mistake it. <laughs> That's not the ending of the next tune. <laughs> <laughs> feel that your music now just simply flows between classical and jazz and ballad and, yeah, and so on, without right. you even almost noticing the join? Yeah. This is why I don't want to be pigeonholed. Don't like to be pigeonholed. I mean, what's a jazz musician doing, playing, 
a Scarlatti sonata moving into my favorite thing. It's got nothing to do with jazz at all. It has a lot to do with music. George returns to England every summer, spending most of his time in the Cotswolds. George became an American citizen, but believe me, he is British to the bone. I have never visited this country one time without feeling that I am once again back home. Ever since I heard Vaughan Williams' variations on green sleeves, I've realized that that's a perfect description of English countryside. And I think there's a tranquility in some of my parts of green sleeve until we decide we're going to get a little bit more up front and, and you know, uh, a bit heavier in texture. like to do is to have you play five notes and I don't know I have no idea what they are until you play them after this I will make a, a melody or depending on what notes you play what comes into my head and out of your five notes will come either a tune or a piece that either comes off or doesn't as the case may be and this is the thing about improvisation All right. Here we go. I lean over here. I do up in this register here. Anywhere. September in the lullaby of the Birdland. Well, it's a, little tiny, it's a little tiny, it's a little tiny Prokofiev type gavard, isn't it? Yeah. Especially that change of key. Ellie discovered that George's knowledge of classical music and talent for improvisation can be combined to devastating effect. There was almost a divorce. <laughs> we were giving a benefit concert in San Francisco, and it was a, an informal concert, and he sat in the front row for the first half, and I did my set, and my accompanist did a wonderful set of Brahms and that sort of thing. And now it is intermission, and the people are filing back into the hall. And George is going to be on. And I turned to him and I said, now, George, come on. 
you're on next. Certainly you have your program set. And he said, well, just about, just about. So we went out and sat. And I had done the vocalese of Rachmaninoff and some Schubert. And my accompanist had done some Brahms and some other things. And when George sat down, he started to play the vocalies of Rachmaninoff that I had done in the first half, and he turned it into Love is a Many Splendored Thing. He did that on every... In other words, we had planned his program for him, and then he just remembered what we had played and sung, and then improvised and brought it into a pop tune. I could have killed him. I could have killed him. We were wor here. Classical singers have to rehearse and rehearse, and these jazzers, <laughs> as I call them, can fall out of bed and go right on stage and wonder. He brought down the house. At the Guildhall School of Jazz in London, George gives a masterclass and passes on some of the wit and wisdom he's acquired after almost 60 years in the business. What is jazz, anyway? Louis Armstrong said, if you have to ask, you'll never know. <laughs> One of the great stride pianists, Fats Waller, and I was fortunate enough to know him. And Fats could stretch 13. <laughs> I'd heard about this, and I took full advantage of my blindness for once. And when I met him for the first time, I deliberately, I shook hands with that, I said, oh, pleased to meet you, Mr. Waller, and the ham was still going on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Pat's had a great sense of humor. Greek wrote a thing called Hall the Mountain King. You might hear it in this piece of music called Viper's Drag, written by Pat's Wall. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Two, three, four. If they have a good sense of harmony, and a good pair of hands and some kind of knowledge of how to use their technique to its best advantage. The more of that they have, the less I can teach them. And then I can dwell into finer points like, uh, oh, inner voicing. It's too loud. Your, too loud. Your, your melody yeah. is... George instantly reproduces Nick's piece. Right. And when you, when you come down for the, the change, the transposition, even come down lower. Right, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. This kind of thing. Yeah, 
It was interesting because the bits I'd sort of heard of George Shearing playing before, and I sort of got the impression he was quite a, you know, he, he did things that were quite structured and, and quite worked out in advance, you know. But I mean, what he did, it sort of proved that he, um, um, well, it was very instinctive, you know, and very spontaneous. You know, but, but nurse him, really, really nurse them. As if you were singing this beautiful ballad right. yeah. behind a huge body of strings. Right. <laughs> All these things start in our heads, you know. All these noises start in our heads. Mm -hmm. And once they do, we bring them down to the fingers. At 75, George remains a favourite of the New York club circuit. He's played for three American presidents, and he's still bringing out new albums, including one that revives the George Shearing Quintet. Have a look back on the distance you've travelled from the ninth son of a Coleman in Battersea, born blind, ending up as one of the great musicians. Do you ever look back and think, oh, how did I get here? All the time. But hopefully I've also proven that I never will and never have forgotten where I came from. What kind of fool am I is meant to put in the mind of the audience that feeling of exhilaration, that feeling of well-being. And to that degree, we throw the hands up and bring them down on these chords to, to, to give the feeling of this is all I've got left and you're welcome to it. Next week, the South Bank.